Yes. So thank you for the for the invitation and the opportunity to to speak here. Um, yes. Yeah, so I'll I'll talk about a, a rather recent approach uh, in asymptotic geometric analysis to uh, to approach via probabilistic methods. Uh, geometric questions on, on high dimensional convex bodies. And let me just uh, briefly motivate it. Um, so, so we all know by, by Clartach's central limit theorem that if we are given any isotropic convex body in high dimensional space, then the typical random projection will be approximately Gaussian distributed. Uh, so this is a very nice result. We have several other central limit theorems um, but, but while the, but the beauty of this uh, universality comes at a, at, at a price, namely that, that this central limit perspective that, that we take um, somehow restricts the information that we can retrieve from the lower dimensional projections that we're looking at. Okay. So, and there's, there's another type of limit theorem, which, which are so-called large deviation principles. And, and in contrast to a central limit theorem, we know that, that the speed will later see exactly what it is. I'll define everything so that so the speed and the, and the rate in a large deviation principle, uh, this is distribution dependent. So it's non-universal. Yeah? So, so it, it carries some of the information of the underlying distribution yeah? or in the geometric sense, um, if we study the large deviation behavior of, uh, of random projections of some convex body, then we can still see the geometry behind it. So, so, so it depends on the geometry of this, of this underlying body. Yeah? Okay. So, so we can study these uh, distinguish high dimensional probability measures via their lower dimensional projections yeah? in contrast to a CRT. Yeah? So this is kind of a motivation why we, why we want to look at large deviations. But also it's just, just from a purely mathematical perspective, it's interesting is okay, you have a central limit theorem for some random geometric quantity. It's a natural question to ask, can I prove a large deviation principle for this random geometric quantity? Okay. So, so there will be three talks and uh, I know many of you are familiar with large deviations, but there are also, some of you who might not be so familiar with it. So I will use the, I will use the first talk to, to give a very short introduction to large deviation theory. Okay, so this will be essentially today, I will introduce you to the key concepts and, and definitions. So, so today I'll give a, let's say, a, a very short introduction, yeah, very short introduction to the theory of large deviations. Yeah, so as I said, I'll introduce some, some fundamental concepts. Yeah. And, and tomorrow we want to see those concepts in action somehow. Yeah. So I'll pick, uh, pick a very, uh, uh, a framework around the geometry of LPN balls. So, so I will prove some, some results, some results around LPN balls so that you see the, the concepts that I introduced today in action, how, how you can apply those to, to derive a large deviation principle for random geometric quantity. And in the third talk, uh, I will present a very recent result, very recent result, uh, which is due to uh, Kim, Liao and Ramanan. I think at least two of them uh, I saw uh, here. So I'll, I'll present a, a recent result from 2020 uh, in which they showed large deviation principles for random projections random projections under an asymptotic thin shell condition. Under an asymptotic thin shell condition. Yeah. So, 
So some are like, like the thin shell condition yields a CLT. We will see that this asymptotic thin shell condition yields a large deviation principle. Yeah? And this result is very, very nice. So as I said, this is due to Kim, Yao, and Ramanam. Because essentially all the all the large deviation results we've we've proved so far. So 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 the whole study was somehow initiated uh, by Gandat, Kim, and Ramanan in two sixteen or two seventeen, and then we proved several results uh, for random geometric quantities. But essentially everything was related uh, to LPN balls, just because there's the uh, probabilistic representation of the cone measure of the uniform distribution due to Schechtmann and Zinn, and this facilitates computations and you can you can prove lots of large deviation principles. Uh, we also proved something for, for shut in classes, but essentially it was all LP ball or non-commutative LP ball related. And, and this, this recent result somehow allows to, to go beyond that. Uh, for instance, uh, you can prove a large deviation principle uh, in the setting of all edge balls, which was not possible before that. Okay, so this will be the third talk. But now I start with a very short introduction to the theory of large deviations. Okay, so, so what's the general question behind it? So let's say you're, you're given random variables x1, x2, and so on, which are iid, and say we have variance x1 is sigma squared is positive, and, and the random variables are centered. Yeah, and we look at Sn, which is the, the sum i from one to n, xi, and an n, so the partial sums. And then we know that by the, by the law, <coughs> law of large numbers, the law of large numbers, this tells us that, that for all epsilon, the limit is n tends to infinity of the probability that as n divided by n is larger than or equal to epsilon, this is this is zero. Huh? So we know that the that the typical behavior is that uh, that this converges to the expectation, which is which is zero here. So, and this would be kind of a large deviation event because we can write this here as as n times epsilon. So, so I go beyond this Gaussian scale. So this is why I say large deviations because in the CLT I would have root n. Now I look on, on the scale of a law of large numbers and, and, and I want to quantify the, the probability of rare events. Yeah? So I want to quantify the probability that I'm away from, from zero yeah? by more than a normal amount, okay? So, so we know that for instance, by Chebyshev's inequality, if you prove it, you get something like one over n or so. Yeah? But, but how fast does it really go? Yeah? So how fast is this convergence to zero here? Yeah? So let's say how fast, how fast does it go? And then you could look at, look at examples. Yeah? Oh, let me just start with an example, which you can do as an exercise. Yeah? You can do as an exercise. So first example, let's say you take GI, I and N, should be uh, normal random variables, independent, uh, independent, and let's say A is positive, then you can show by direct computation that the limit as n tends to infinity of one over n log of the probability that S n is bounded below by A times n, uh, this is equal to minus a squared over two. No? So here you, you said, if you want to prove this, you just use that uh, if you have some, some positive t, but then uh, t divided by one plus t squared, e to the minus t squared over two uh, is bounded above by, the, by this integral here, this Gaussian integral. And this is bounded above by one over t e to the minus t squared over two. Okay, so if you use this, you can prove this this limiting condition that you get here. Yeah? 
Another example, another example, so a second example. So this was Gaussian. So the next one you, which might come to mind is to look at Rademacher random variables. No? So let's say you have xi, i and n you know, are independent, independent Rademacher random variables. Then, and again, let's say A is positive, then you can show that the limit is n tends to infinity of one over n log probability that Sn is bounded below by A times n is equal to minus I of A, yeah, where I of A is the following function. Yeah, uh, following function. Um, it is one plus x over two log one plus x, oops, one plus x, plus one minus x over two log one minus x, whenever x is in minus one one, and it's plus infinity otherwise, okay? As you can also do as an exercise, okay? So, in any case, so, so looking at these two, two examples, what you, what you see is somehow um, the following behavior. If you, if you have the sequence of random variables, at least in these two cases, which is either one of these distributions, um, then we have seen that essentially the partial sums of these random variables or the probability that they deviate, uh, uh, that they're larger than or equal to a times n, this is essentially e to the minus n and then i of a, okay? So this was our, our i of a here. And in the, in the Gaussian case, it was a squared over two. Yeah, so, so, so we've seen in these examples somehow that, that we get, uh, uh, that we get an exponential speed here, yeah, e to the minus n, and and this function here, which we could compute in the other, uh, in these two examples, this determines somehow the the rate at which we decay exponentially. Yeah. So 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 this is way faster this convergence as suggested by by Chebyshev's inequality when you prove the the, the weak law of large numbers. Okay. So now, okay, then, then you have seen these two examples. You can ask is there some, some more general principle behind this or some, some more general idea? And, and this is the case. Yeah, this is the case indeed. So, uh, and I want to show why, I mean, one can simply see that this is the case, that you have this exponential uh, con convergence and, uh, under some regular regularity assumptions. Yeah? So, so to see this, consider random variables which are independent and identically distributed, say for simplicity centered, okay? Centered and assume that they have all uh, exponential moments. Yeah? So, and assume that for all t and r, let's say, um, we have that the moment generating function, the moment generating function e to the tx1, this is finite, okay? Assume this for now. So we have a nice set of random variables. Um, so then, we can deduce such a large deviation upper bound essentially by using Markov's inequality or what you know. So we derive the, what, what is generally called the Chernoff bound. Yeah? So then let's say for, for some positive T and A positive, yeah? Remember here we have, I assume for simplicity that we're working with uh, centered random variables. Yeah? Then, then it follows from, from Markov or exponential Markov that the probability that Sn is bounded below by A times N. Now this 
you could write like this, e to the t as n is bounded below by e to the t a n. Yeah? Now you use Markov. So this is bounded above by e to the t s m divided by e to the t a n. Now you can rewrite this. You have independent uh, random variables. Yeah, so you can take this, write this as a product. They are identically distributed and so on. If you use this, then you get that this e to the minus t a n plus n times the log of the moment generating function. Yeah? So just follow the computation, uh, independence identically distributed, and then you get this. So, so, so let me write it like this. So this is e to the minus, e to the minus n, and then you get somehow t a minus log lambda x of t, okay? And, and this is an upper bound, okay? So we have this, the, the probability that s n is bounded below by a times n can be bounded by this. Yeah, and t was just some, some parameter, okay, positive. So I can now optimize in t you know, to get this inequality as good as possible. You know? So I take the supremum here over all t. You know? so, so optimizing, optimizing, we get the following, optimizing in t. You know? So we get that the probability that Sn is bounded below by a times n is bounded above by e to the minus n. And then you get here the supremum over all positive t, t times a minus log lambda x of t, okay? And what you see, <clears throat> what you see here is that this is essentially the Legendre transform of the, the log moment generating function. You know? Uh, so, so this is the Legendre transform of uh, of the lock. Let me write it like this: moment generating function. Yeah. So, so we can write this as follows. If we go back to this uh, logarithmic scale that I've presented in the two examples, yeah? if I go back to this logarithmic scale. Then I could write, um, so that is we get uh, lim soup, let's say lim soup, is n tends to infinity of one over n log probability that s n is bounded below by a times n. This is bounded above by minus the supremum over all t positive t times a minus log lambda x of t. Okay, so, so this suggests already, so this, this, this simple Chernoff bound somehow already suggests a relation between the, the, the asymptotic probabilities of rare events you know, on, the one, on the one side and, and the Legendre transform of the log moment generating function on the other. You know. So, so, so once you have this bound, the immediate question is if, whether this is sharp or not. Uh, can you prove a, a corresponding lower bound? Uh, and this is indeed the case. And this was proved in 1938 by, by Cromer. Okay. So, so let's say one, one can prove a matching lower bound. Okay. A matching lower bound. And uh, this is the following theorem, which I state in its simplest form. Yeah, you can prove it for, I don't know, locally convex house of topological spaces and so on. Yeah, I'll just restrict to R and, and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, we're gonna use it on RD or so. Yeah? But I will just state it on, on R right now in its most simple, simple form, okay? So it's the following theorem, which is due to Cromer and it's 19. 38. So, so if you have random variables which are iid and possess all exponential moments, 
this can be relaxed. Actually, you just need that uh, uh, the, the log moment generating function is finite in some neighborhood of zero, but let's say we assume it now for all T and R. So, so this, so this is capital lambda X of T is the log moment generating function e to the t x1, this should be finite. And if this is the case, then for all a larger than the expected value, okay, so I want to, to, to deviate from the typical behavior. So I pick some a which is larger than this typical value that I would get from, the, from, a, from a law of large numbers. Um, then under these assumptions, we can prove that the following limit exists and uh, this is as follows. So the limit is n tends to infinity of one over n log of the probability that Sn is bounded below by a times n is equal to minus the Legendre transform of the log moment generating function at a. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah, so this is what, what one can prove. Yeah, so this is the Legendre transform, okay. Okay, so, and if you now would go back to the examples that I presented, you can of course use this, use this result and, and you'll see, okay, that, that these rate functions that, we com that you can compute by hand yeah, are actually Legendre transforms. Yeah? So this is somehow a nice result because it tells you something about the, the form of the rate function yeah? that you can identify it as, as, as the uh, Legendre transform of the, of the log moment generating function. Yeah? So essentially the, the proof of the upper bound I have presented because this is just a chain of bound, then one has to be a bit careful because um, this holds for t larger than zero, but you want some any t and r and, and uh, but this is not, not really a problem. If you just take the, take the distribution of mass of, of your random variables into account, then you can see that it's actually attained for some point on the positive real line. Okay, so this is really, this is really the upper bound I presented essentially. Yeah? So, so what's the, how, how can one prove a lower bound? No, this, is, this is somehow more delicate. Yeah? So, so and I just want to give you a, well, it's a very heuristic uh, sense of, of why the proof goes as it goes. Yeah? So, so say we're given somehow the following. Yeah? So we have x1 plus and so on plus xn. And this is the probability that we want to investigate. So the partial sum should be bounded below by a times n. Yeah? So say, say a is uh, larger than the expected value of x1, which is say mu and uh, sigma squared should be the, the variance of x1. Um, then somehow uh, first reflex is you, you renormalize everything in a sense that you, that, you, that you can apply Gaussian approximation, right? So you could, you could somehow say that this is equal to uh, the probability that as n minus n times mu divided by uh, sigma root n is bounded below by root n a minus mu divided by divided by sigma. No? So of course you cannot just apply the central limit theorem, but but let's say you have large n, then uh, this should behave as follows. This should be more or less one over uh, root two pi integral root n a minus mu divided by sigma to infinity. And then this Gaussian, Gaussian part here, okay? It's Gaussian integral. Okay, yeah. So, and the problem is now that this, that this, your, your, your Gaussian approximation, yeah? This is not, not really good because you have here this, this root n term, yeah? So, so as long as, as this part somehow is big, this approximation is not good in the sense that the ratio can be can be large somehow. Yeah? The difference can't be large, right? Because every both both sides are small. Yeah? 
But somehow uh, this, this is not a good approximation. So um, you want to get rid of this part somehow. Yeah, so this, this somehow what bothers you, this part here. And in order to do that, you, you tilt your measure, you tilt your measure, yeah? so, so the distribution of your original random variables. So you tilt it in a sense that, that you add more weight to larger values. Yeah? So you can shift the mean somehow to the right um, because I mean, I didn't say it, but, but without loss of generality, when you prove the lower bound, you can assume that the expectation is negative of your random variables, let's say, and that A is zero. So, so you, could, you could shift the way to the right yeah, by an exponential tilt. Uh, and then you take a sequence of random variables that has this distribution, this new tilt distribution. And, and this new tilt distribution is chosen in such a way that the expectation of your new random variables is equal to, to uh, so, so, you, so you get zero, yeah? So it's equal to zero in the sense of uh, that A is zero yeah? or, or mu is equal to A. Yeah? So you tilt it in this way. So you get rid of this, this part somehow. Of course you pay a price in your, in your integrant, but this is a price that you can pay yeah? because yeah, this is okay. But this is somehow which which uh, which tells you why the, the the proof of the lower bound is as it is somehow yeah because you you could write such a Gaussian approximation this is not good you want to get rid of this part you pay a price here in the integrand by tilting the measure or changing the measure uh, and then you can apply the CLT in this tilted setting yeah there you can really apply the CLT and everything works nicely yeah so. Um, yeah, so this is just very, a very heuristic uh, picture of it, but, but let me say a bit more now to, regarding the lower bound. So we have seen the upper bound, uh, lower bound. So, so let's say mu is the, the distribution of our random variables. Then you pick, uh, then you tilt the measure, as I said, in the following way. It's e to the yeah some t min x and rho. I'll say in a moment what it, what it is uh, mu dx. Yeah, so you shift weight uh, to the to the larger values, and and rho is just e to the minus of the log moment generating function at zero. Yeah, I can choose zero here because I can restrict myself to the case where. This is negative and a is zero, okay, without loss of generality. Yeah, so this is this zero here. Yeah. Uh, so this is rho, which is equal to the infimum over all t and r of the uh, moment generating function. And, and t min is positive such that, such that lambda x of t min is equal to rho. Yeah. And then you consider a new set of random variables, which are distributed according to your tilted measure in your head. And then with respect to this new measure, your random variables are centered and have a certain variance, okay? But, but the key point is now, that if you if you now look at uh, if you if you let s n hat be the partial sum of these new random variables, then you can rewrite the probability that s n is bounded below by zero. This is now remember again I restricted here to this to this case here yeah, a is zero. So I look here at this lower bound. So this is then equal to, you can do the computation, do the change of measure, yeah, use integration with respect to the push forward, and then you get rho to the n expectation of e to the minus t min s n hat and characteristic function where s n hat is non-negative, okay? So this you can check by direct computation, which means that the quantity we're interested in, one over n log of the probability that Sn is bounded below by zero, 
is equal to log of rho plus something, yeah, plus something, one over m log expectation of e to the minus t min s n hat characteristic function here, the same. Yeah. And this is already the part, this is the part that you want, yeah, because rho, again, I did it right here, rho is this e to the minus, yeah. this is the part that we want because it's log rho, this gives you the minus of the Legendre transform at zero, and this part. So if we can prove that this part here is, is positive, then we get the desired lower bound. Okay, this is all we, all we need to do. And this you can establish using the CLT. Uh, I'll not, so I'll just write it follows from the CLT. Um, follows from the CLT now, because you have tilted the measure nicely that you can apply it, that the lim inf as n tends to infinity of one over n log expectation e uh, to the minus t min s n hat, s n hat non-negative, that this is uh, positive, okay? So how do you do it somehow? You, you get a lower bound on this here. If you write here, s n is larger than or equal to zero and is less than or equal to root n, let's say. Yeah? And then you can normalize by this root n and then you get here, you can somehow, you, you get here a Gaussian part. Yeah, You can estimate this part here because you know that s n is between, let's say, or s n divided by root n is between one and zero and so on. And then you can apply the central limit theorem to get the desired lower bound. Yeah? So the idea is tilt your measure so that you can apply the central limit theorem, and then you get the lower bound, okay? So, um, so this is this. Um, as I said, so it's, it's enough if, if you have uh, finiteness on, a, on, a, on, a set, uh, on, on, a, on an open neighborhood of zero, you can, let me write a, a, a remark. Um, so if, if x1 and x2 are, say, iid random variables with heavy tails, what happens then? Let's say it's not this nice situation we have, where we have finite exponential moments, but let's assume we have stretched exponential tails. Yeah? So iid uh, with, with heavy tails, with heavy tails, yeah? which means that we have for some r in 0, 1 and some, some constants, yeah? Um, write it like this, e to the minus c t to the r is bounded above by this. Yeah? So this is the, the tail of the random variable. And this behaves like some other constant e to the minus t, uh, constant missing. Yeah? Okay, so because r is between zero and one, these are, these are heavy tails, then, then you can still establish sort of a, of a Cromer a result uh, in the following sense that, that if A is larger than the expectation of X1, then you get that the limit as N tends to infinity of one divided by N to the R, not divided by N of log. So you get a different speed somehow, probability that as N is bounded below by A times N, this is equal to minus your constant that appears there C a minus expectation x1 to the power r. Yeah? So this gives you an example also of sort of a Cromer theorem where you, where you do not have a convex rate function, yeah? the non-convex function. Okay, so this is, this is Cromer's theorem and, and we want to, or, or we, so, so what then happened is, is that, that Varadhan, uh, introduced somehow an abstract theory of large deviations. Yeah? So, so what's the abstract abstract theory of large deviations? So he generalized, so Varadhan generalized the idea uh, behind Cromer's theorem. Yeah? So, so Varadhan, or alphabetically, so Donska, Donska and Varadhan uh, introduced, uh, yeah, introduced a systematic study 
of the probabilities of rare events uh, of the systematic study of the, let's say, asymptotic probabilities, asymptotic probabilities of rare events. Uh, and, and for this, uh, Varadam was awarded in 2007 the, the Arbo Prize. And, and uh, if I quote, so they said, so for his fundamental contributions to probability theory, and in particular for, for creating a unified theory of large deviations. And how does this unified large deviation principle, what we call it, look like? So let's say he is a Polish space, right now I'm on Polish spaces, he is Polish, and, and you look at a function i from your Polish space into zero infinity. Uh, this should be a rate function, a rate function in the sense in the sense that it's uh, not plus infinity everywhere, and it should be lower semi-continuous. No? Lower semi-continuous, that is, it has closed level sets. No? Contin yeah, I don't have that. So lower semi-continuous. No? So let's say we're given this the Polish space, we have such a, such a rate function. No? Um, then we say that a sequence mu n and an N of probability measures, of probability measures, um, satisfies uh, a large deviation principle, a large deviation principle. Mm -hmm. So a large deviation principle or LDP um, with speed, let's say, Sn, uh, some sequence uh, tends to infinity, and rate or rate function i. By definition, if and only if we have that minus the infimum over all x in a, so I should say so for all, so for all, if we have for all um, Borel sets on e, that minus the infimum x in the interior of A, i of x is bounded above by lim inf, one over Sn log mu n of A. This is trivially bounded by the lim sup, of course, one over Sn log mu n of A. And this is bounded above by minus the infimum over all x in the closure of A. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, this is the definition of a large deviation principle. Yeah. Now, the first question is why such a weird definition, right? Why not just say, okay, we take uh, that the limit as n tends to infinity of one over n log mu n of a is equal to minus uh, uh, the infimum over a. Yeah? So why do I look at open and, and closed sets here, yeah? or uh, I can rewrite it, or why do I look at, yeah. Um, and, and the thing is as follows, so if you just take a, a sequence of measures which has no atoms, for instance, yeah? take a sequence of measures that ha has no atoms, then you know that mu n of any set containing a point x from your Polish space, that this is zero, yeah? which means that that uh, the limit condition could only hold if your function i is plus infinity everywhere. And this is quite, uh, quite not so interesting, okay? So you somehow have to relax this limit condition that you, that you require the, the limit to be equal to something. So, uh, and this is somehow the, the definition uh, given, which, which, which led to a, to a rich theory, you know, the development of a rich theory. You know? You can prove that uh, these rate functions uh, are unique. This is a simple exercise. And uh, you can also show that, uh, maybe remark, remark uh, that Cromer's theorem is a, is a large deviation principle for the empirical distribution. Uh, so, so somehow Cromer, Cromer 
uh, says that essentially Sm divided by n, the distribution of this empirical average. So the sequence uh, satisfies an LDP at speed n, at speed n with rate i uh, being the Legendre transform of the log moment generating function. More precisely, this is, I didn't say this, but this is a so-called good rate function, good rate function, or just GRF, uh, in the sense that it's not just lower semi-continuous, that is, it has uh, closed level sets, but it has compact level sets. Yeah? And if we have compact level sets, we say it's a good rate function. Yeah? Okay, so this is this is uh, this somehow generalizes the idea behind uh, Cromer's theorem. This is the so-called large deviation principle, and um, you can uh, well well another I should try. so another famous result from large deviation theory is is Zarnoff's theorem. So Zarnoff's theorem. Uh, and it's an LDP for the empirical measure. Yeah? LDP for empirical measures. And, uh, and so, yeah? let me present this result and then, and then stop. So, so again, let, let E be a Polish space, yeah? because our I will use this result or talk about this result or this result is related to, to, to what I will speak about in the third part and yeah, the third lecture. So E Polish and, uh, and mu should be uh, a probability measure on your Polish space. I always consider the Borel sigma algebra, okay? And, and we want to take random variables uh, which are IID, um, E valued, Okay, take values in your Polish space uh, and have common law, common law mu, common law mu. Then we define mu n, the empirical uh, measure, as the sum i from one to n of the of delta xi, yeah, n and n. So this is the empirical measure corresponding to your random variables. Yeah is the empirical measure. And um, the question is, so, so, so this is a random, this is a random measure. Yeah? There's a random element in, in the space of probability measures on E, yeah? which I equip with a weak topology. Uh, and since E is a Polish space, M1E is a Polish space. Yeah? For instance, you can metrize it using the Proharov metric, okay? Yeah, so this is again a Polish space, which makes this a random element in, in, my, in my space M1E uh, with a weak topology, let's say. Yeah? And now you can ask yourself, does, does this random element here, does this random object satisfy a large deviation principle? Yeah? Okay. Um, let's see. Do we have an LDP for more precise, not this, but for the distribution of mu n, huh? for the distribution of mu n. Yeah? And if you ask this question, yeah, if, you, if you've seen what I did before, I started with a law of large numbers and then somehow developed the large de or Cromer's theorem. Now you ask this question. So to answer it, you want to first get a sense for law of large numbers. Yeah? So what is the typical behavior of your mu n? And once you understood your typical behavior, you can ask, so what are the probability, probabilities that it deviates from this typical behavior? Yeah? So, so what's the typical behavior? This is, uh, well, you can do the follow. So let's say f is a, is a function, uh, a bounded continuous function on your space E, real valued, okay, then it follows from the strong law of large numbers immediately that mu n of f, uh, which I define to be the expectation with respect to my empirical measure of the function f, 
this is just one divided by n sum i from one to n of f of x i because I have i id. Yeah, everything is nice. This converges uh, p almost surely um, to the expectation of f with respect to your measure mu. Okay, so this follows from the from the strong law of large numbers, and and now um, since uh, well. Since, since we have a Polish space, yeah? so since, uh, since E is a Polish space, yeah? we know that there exists a countable set of functions in CBE, which determines weak convergence. Yeah? That is a set of measures converges weakly to some, some, some measure new, if the integrals uh, converge for all these functions. Yeah? So integral over let's say Fi, d nu n converges to integral f i uh, f d nu. Yeah? So and since we're in a, in, a, in a setting of Polish spaces, so we can deduce, um, so, so we have this, of course, so we have this here for, for all f in particular. Um, so, so let f, f j, let's say f j, j and n uh, set of functions Set of functions in CBE determining weak convergence. Then we know that <laughs> this relation here holds for all these functions here. And since this determines weak convergence, the sequence, yeah, because we're in the setting of Polish spaces, then we know that mu m, then we know that mu m converges to, to mu, yeah, p almost surely, yeah, as n tends to infinity. And this is the typical behavior. Yeah? It's not really a surprise, right? So if, if our random variables are, have law mu, the empirical distribution converges to this. So this follows from the law of large numbers. And now Zanoff's theorem, Zanoff tells us now that, um, that rho n, which is the distribution of of mu n, okay. This satisfies an LDP at speed at speed n, speed n, um, with I should write it more properly. Uh, satisfies an LDP at speed n with good rate function, which is also convex. Uh, I write it like this: with good rate function being the relative entropy with respect to mu. Yeah. So, so it satisfies a large deviation principle in the weak, uh, on, the, on the space of probability measures equipped with a weak topology with a rate function being the relative uh, entropy. So nu is mapped to H nu mu, which is integral, um, d nu, uh, d nu log. So this is the relative entropy log d nu, d nu, d mu. If mu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, and it's plus infinity otherwise. Yeah. It's plus infinity otherwise. Yeah. So this is the famous theorem of Sarnoff going back to 1961, I think, and. What does it tell us? So now in other words, so this is, so now I wrote it down like this. It looks, if you see it for the first time, it may be, may not be so easy to understand, but so what does it tell me? It tells me that the probability that the empirical, uh, empirical distribution yeah, resembles somehow a measure which is different from my mu. Yeah? Because I know the typical behavior, it should be mu in the limit, but the probability that it, that what I see resembles somehow something else, a measure new, let's say, different from new. This is like, like e to the minus n and then the relative entropy. Yeah? So the rate is determined by this uh, kuhlberg leibler divergence or relative entropy of the measure new with respect to mu. Yeah? And and if you want to prove the lower bound, again, you someone nicely see how it en enters. Yeah? The lower bound is again, 
based on a, on a change of measure, based on a change of measure. And then what you really do is you, you somehow, uh, it amounts to computing the cost of forcing your process to behave like the other measure, not your measure mu, which is underlying your the underlying distribution, but somehow what is the cost if you force it to look like your, your other measure mu? Uh, this is what you do. Uh, and this brings in uh, rather Nicod Nicodem derivatives and, and this leads to, to relative entropies entering. Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is Zarnoff's theorem and I think I'm over time. So I'll, I'll stop here. Um, so tomorrow I will just briefly present three general principles that allow you to deduce uh, large deviation principles from let's say existing ones. If you know something satisfies one, you can somehow construct new large deviation principles. And those, those three pr principles we then want to see in action when we, when we study large deviations for uh, related to, to LP, LP balls. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, Yosha, for your